and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Ladia Kiridunwale, the headlines. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says Russia is suffering heavy losses in Ukraine's eastern Donetsk region. Western media reports say Russian President Vladimir Putin has signed a law to mobilize Russian citizens convicted of serious crimes for the war in Ukraine. And the mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, warns of evacuations if power is lost in the city. Russia is said to be suffering heavy losses in continuing, quote, fierce attacks in Ukraine's eastern Donetsk region and is preparing new assaults on Ukrainian energy infrastructure. And that's according to the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, in his usual nightly address to the nation. Mr. Zelensky says he believes Russia is concentrating forces and means for a possible repetition of mass attacks on infrastructure energy in the first instance. Very harsh Russian attacks on the Donetsk region continue. The enemy suffers serious losses there, but despite everything, despite any losses, continue to drive its mobilized and mercenaries to their deaths. I thank all our soldiers who are withstanding this truly terrible pressure. We remain steadfast and heroically defend our positions. We also understand that the terrorist state is concentrating forces and means for a possible repetition of mass attacks on our infrastructure. First of all, energy in particular. For this, Russia needed Iranian missiles. We are preparing to respond. Meanwhile, mass, uh, Western media reports say Russian President Vladimir Putin has signed a law to conscript citizens with unexpunged or outstanding convictions for murder, robbery, larceny, drug trafficking, and other serious crimes under the criminal code of the Russian Federation to be called up for military service. This makes it possible to mobilize hundreds of thousands of people who have been sentenced to probation or have recently been released from colonies who were previously forbidden to serve. The only group of criminals exempted from the decree are those who committed sex crimes against minors, treason, spying, and terrorism. Also excluded are those convicted of the attempted assassination of a government official, hijacking of aircraft, extremist activity, and illegal handling of nuclear materials and radioactive substances. President Vladimir Putin is said to have... Uh, stated that the Kremlin had already mobilized an additional 18,000 soldiers above its goal of 300,000 to fight its war in Ukraine from the general male population of Russia. Meanwhile, in uh, uh, Ukraine's Russian-held Nova Kakova dam has been uh, damaged in shelling by Ukrainian forces. Citing emergency services, the Russian state-owned news agency TASS reports that a rocket launched by a U.S.-made HIMARS missile system had hit the dam's lock and caused damage. The official quoted uh, said it was an attempt to create the conditions for a humanitarian catastrophe by breaching at the dam. However, the reports provided no evidence to support the allegation, which could not be immediately verified. The vast Nova Kakova Dam, which blocks the Dipno River upstream of Kursin, where Ukrainian forces have been making advances, has taken on a vital and strategic significance in recent weeks. Both Russia and Ukraine have since October repeatedly accused each other of planning to breach the dam using explosives in a move that would flood much of the area downstream in what would likely cause a major destruction around Kursin City. And Ukraine continues its offensive on Russian-held regions. Another is the Leninsky district of Russian-controlled Donetsk. The head of the Russian-backed Donetsk administration, Alexei Kulomzin, said on his Instagram channel page that Ukrainian troops also hid a Budyanovsky district of the city. A residential house was almost totally destroyed, but no casualties have been reported. A neighbor said the owner was lucky not to be in the house at the time of shelling, and in that uh, his dog was, however, killed. Donetsk City has been controlled by Russian-backed Donetsk People's Republic since 2014. 
Russia moved in September to annex the Donetsk, Luhansk, Kursid and Zaporizhia regions of Ukraine in the biggest expansion of Russian territory in at least half a century. Moscow declared the annexations after holding what it called referendums in occupied areas of Ukraine. Western governments in Kiev said the votes breached international law and were coercive and non-representative. And back in uh, Kiev, Mayor Vitaly Klitschko says that the city is preparing for a total power, heating and water outage. The power grid and water infrastructure in and near Kiev have been targeted by Russian airstrikes in recent weeks and energy providers have resorted to planned power cuts to avoid overloads and to allow infrastructure be repaired. Speaking on Ukrainian television, Mr. Klitschko says how well we'll hold out depends on how well we're prepared for different scenarios. He asked uh, Kiev residents in worst scenarios of total blackouts to consider moving to emergency accommodation with friends and family who live outside Kiev with access to autonomous water and heating supplies. We did everything so that this doesn't happen. But let's be honest, our enemies are doing everything to keep the city without heat, electricity and water supply. And in general, they want us all to die. This is their task. And how well we'll hold out depends on how well we're prepared for different scenarios. The future of our country and the future of every single citizen depends on this level of preparation. That is why we need to be prepared. This is not a war. This is terrorism. This is genocide. Vladimir Putin doesn't need us Ukrainians. In Zaporizhia, Russia fired two S-300 missiles on the city after midnight, uh, killing at least one person and destroying a commercial uh, warehouse. The regional governor says emergency services retrieved the body of the warehouse's executive director, 40-year-old Vitali, according to his mother, Eleonora, who was on the attack site. Uh, the mother said her son was in the warehouse at night to look after the company property when the attack happened. She adds that his wife and daughter have been in Warsaw since the start of the war and are yet to be informed. Let's talk now to Ambassador Joseph Ayalogo, Niger's former ambassador to Switzerland and the United Nations in Geneva. He joins us uh, from uh, London, uh, the British capital. Good morning to you, Your Excellency. Thank you for your time. Good morning. Let's, uh, let's, let's uh, begin on something we haven't uh, yet reported uh, today, and that is what came out uh, from over the weekend. Uh, the whole idea behind this uh, grain initiative, there's so many things that seem to be in the air now. Uh, Russia has indicated that it is willing to continue uh, with the grain initiative uh, after pulling out uh, or suspending its uh, participation. Uh, but there are other things that seem to be happening. Russia, for example, wants more emphasis put on its own side of uh, the uh, restrictions uh, to sell uh, fertilizer and some of its agricultural produce, which seems not to have happened uh, in the deal so far. Do you think uh, it's quite possible that um, this could be the deal breaker if it doesn't appear that the other parties are willing to consider the uh, Russian demands? Well, it could be really because Russia also wants to use the opportunity of the, the deal to break, uh, well, the jinx of uh, some limitations on on uh, on her, its movements, and uh, it's a quid pro quo. You for them, you allow them to you you you, you reduce on. Uh, the various uh, strikes uh, on them, pressures on them, and they allow you to they go along with you with uh, with regard to, to 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 the to the green deal. I think that's the situation. So I, I think that uh, if we really the world really wants the green deal to take place, they must 
think of considering a little bit of what Russia wants uh, as a quid pro quo. There were, there were protests uh, over the weekend in uh, various cities around uh, Europe in particular and so on, uh, asking uh, for whatever deal uh, to be reached to uh, bring about peace. Uh, this is uh, bringing diplomacy back to the forefront after it seemed to have taken a backseat because uh, in many countries in Europe, energy prices, cost of living, inflation, and all of that is telling. Uh, in the, uh, where you are uh, speaking to us uh, from, uh, Britain has had uh, three prime ministers uh, over the last uh, seven or eight weeks. Uh, and that is part of the turmoil uh, that the economic situation has brought about as a result uh, of this war in Ukraine. Do you think the fine balance between support for territorial integrity and therefore for Ukraine is now being balanced with the economic situation in some of these European countries where things are really tough and they're not getting any easier? Well, that's a tricky one. Um, nobody wants to ignore the, the basic element on, on which nations now relate, themselves, relate with themselves, which is respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty, which as Russia has undermined. Nobody wants to give way to that. But of course, the reality is that uh, Russia um, still wants to, to, to push its own agenda, that is uh, hold on to bits of uh, Ukraine. Uh, there is a difficulty, really. I, I, I am sure that in the minds of uh, yeah, at least the, the the, the leaders in the European capitals, this must be the challenge, their worries at this moment. Um, I, but I don't think it's quite easy uh, for them to, to ignore the, the key issue of respect for territorial integrity. So we, we will see that being tossed up and down about. But let's, let's hope that nobody really sacrifices territorial integrity for any other thing, because that's the plank on which relations between countries now stand. Uh, tomorrow, uh, which is the 8th uh, of, of November, sees the U.S. midterm elections, and much was made of uh, last week of uh, statements that indicated that perhaps uh, still talking about this issue of peace and uh, uh, the economic crisis that if the Republicans were to take over Congress, either the House of Reps or both the House of Reps and Senate, they might not, you know, be as robust uh, in their military and financial support for Ukraine as the, the Democrat-led administration had been thus far. In fact, some of them have gone as far as to say that, you know, the blank check that uh, President Joe Biden had written uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, Ukraine was not considering America first and that, that America's citizens should be first. Do you see a real, you know, fear? Do you have a real fear or do you, have, do you see a real threat that if America uh, uh, and the Republicans take control of Congress, we might have a dial back of this support and that might have reverberations in other places where the Ukrainians have been able to get support? Well, that's uh, quite a number of ifs. That's the outcome of the election. And uh, of course, that's not going to change the, the, the balance, the presidency. Uh, it's not going to throw out Biden yet, even though there will be some uh, recalculation in the, in the, in the parliament. Um, we'll see how it comes up. Uh, there could be, assuming that this scenario really happens, maybe a slight change very slightly, or difficulty in getting through, through Congress some of the things that uh, Biden might want to do. But internally, they know how to get about it. They have uh, presidential uh, instructions, I mean, uh, directives and so on. I think Biden knows how to get, uh, get around to do what he needs to do. Uh, so I am not too worried. It's a little bit worrisome, but I'm not too worried about that. You're, you're a veteran diplomat, uh, Ambassador Ayalogu, and you have seen these things uh, uh, unfold from time to time. Uh, someone I talked to uh, said uh, Europe is playing 
good cop, bad cop with uh, President Putin, in that you have the likes of uh, Emmanuel Macron and uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who are still talking to Mr. Putin and who are still, you know, uh, getting uh, communications to him. And then you have the others who are not talking to him, who are, you know, who are basically saying, look, except he gets goes back to pre-February 24, you know, nothing is going to change uh, and all of that. But do you still see a window here? Uh, for diplomacy to come into this, or have we gone past that? Because now we are approaching the start of the tenth month of this uh, uh, of this crisis, mm. and it doesn't seem as if anybody is able to decisively win militarily. So at the end of the day, it's still probably going to come round to diplomacy and negotiation. Well, you know what diplomacy the books teach us is that at the end of the day, there is always going to be diplomacy, even. Even if any of the combatants win, of course, you know, history, at the end of every war, there's always a peace talk. Um, well, having said that, I think that the good cop, bad cop thing that you describe is probably another diplomatic strategy. They don't want to close all the doors. Uh, Putin, of course, needs to be told that there is a limit that there are things you can't do, uh, and, uh, and and so on. So I think it, it, I think that this strategy would be part of the what we are going to be seeing for some time. It is quite sad, of course, that the war has gone on for too long or this long, um, when we should have been seeing a escalation of, of the crisis. But all this lies in the domain of, of uh, the aggressor, who we all know, and just has to pull back at the end of the day. That's what the, that's the message that the Europe and probably everybody else wants to, 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 to send across. But part of what complicates this, uh, Ambassador, is the fact that uh, Russia has nuclear weapons, and it has, whether it's a bluff or it's a real thing, it has said, look, if it, if, it, if it is pushed to the wall, it will use them. So perhaps that is part of what is keeping uh, the hands of those who may have been more robust uh, in what they are doing uh, from going after, because that is mutually assured destruction if we start talking about nuclear weapons. America has nuclear weapons, Russia does, China does, France does, and Britain does uh, amongst the declared powers. There are a whole lot of other people who have too. Uh, and who are supporting Russia. You, uh, the North Koreans have it, the Chinese uh, have it, the Indians and Pakistanis have nuclear weapons, you know. And so, so uh, once we start talking nuclear weapons, we're in a whole different uh, uh, world, aren't we? Well, of course, that's true. And uh, that, that definitely has been holding the hands of a lot of uh, uh, state stakeholders in this matter. I, I recall... Uh, maybe two days ago, even yesterday, there was this discussion with uh, between Putin and Macron, and uh, Putin did make some comments about uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that uh, kept well, worried Macron a bit or a lot. Um, of course, um, we can we definitely know that Putin has been playing around with this issue of capacity, his capacity to do a lot more damage using nuclear. Uh, that some people say, oh, he can't do it. He knows, uh, he knows the consequences because uh, nuclear weapons don't, don't uh, spare even the owners in terms of uh, effect. But of course, you know that individuals over history have done things knowing that it is might even be against them, but their drive is to see the achievement of their objective. So, uh, tendencies that you listen to Putin uh, through around the, the scare of nuclear, you will want to say, oh, you can't do it. But then, uh, recent examples will tell us also that maybe he might. After all, we did hear when he was saying he wasn't going to attack. Uh, Ukraine, but eventually he did. Um, so it's a problem. It's quite a problem, and uh, it should not be ignored. Uh, and people are not really 
ignoring it. They're worried about it. They're definitely. Ambassador, I, uh, as, as, as we wind this down, I, I, I want to ask this final question. Um, if you were to mention one country that could step into this breach and bring both sides to the table, knock heads together, uh, who would that be? And how do you think they should go about it? Well, we would have, we would have thought that some of the countries that are close to uh, Russia and probably big enough to 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 well let me let me not use the word threat but to 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 wield a big stick over Russia we would have been able to say look you've gone enough you've done enough now uh, get back to the table the, to the negotiating table and let let not let uh, let let us uh, miss what getting back to the drawing board or table or negotiating table required that uh, Putin would need to pull back. That's the first step, need to pull back. I think that a country like uh, China, India, should be big enough to pointedly do this what we are hoping, expecting to be done. That is tell Russia, back off. But Indeed. we had to make you asked me to mention names. <laughs> yes, I did. I did. Yes. <laughs> a lot of China, a lot of India, yeah. and so on. Yes. America yeah. should be able to do it, but we we see US in a in a in an you know an interesting position. It ha it has capacity, but it is being seen as part of the combatants. So yes. it's difficult. It, it, yeah, it's, it's difficult for, for them a bit to say, stop this, unless they can actually go right away and use force to impress upon Russia that you've had you've done enough, which they aren't ready to do yet. They are not. They, they do not appear yeah. to be, indeed. Uh, uh, Your Excellency, thank you so much, Ambassador Joseph Ayalogo, for your time. And for your perspective, uh, very interesting, uh, very complicated, uh, but we'll say we'll, we'll say hi in Panza. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Yes, thank you. After the break, thousands of protesters around the world call for peaceful solutions to the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Please stay on with us. Welcome back. Thanks for staying tuned. Residents of a town on eastern Ukraine's front line say they are coping and hanging on, living amidst our striking destruction and a major Ukrainian military presence. The town of Sivesk lies only a few kilometers away from Russian occupied territory in the eastern Donetsk region. Its central avenue is covered in massive craters left from Russian missiles and airstrikes, some as new as four days old. Town streets are teeming with Ukrainian military and the reverberating bang of outgoing artillery can be heard every few seconds. Despite all this, a few residents remain determined to get through the winter with what resources they have. Many apartment complexes have not a single intact window left, but people continue to live inside the structure's basements, keeping themselves warm with whatever firewood they can salvage. They've taken up residence in the makeshift shelter since July of this year. In Russia, at least 13 people were killed in a nightclub fire in the city of Kostroma that officials believe was started by a clubber letting off fireworks. The police have already identified and detained the suspect, according to the Ministry of Internal Affairs media website. The fire at the Polygon Club started around 2.30 a.m., uh, with 200 people, uh, 50 people evacuated from the building. At least five other fires have broken out at restaurants since the start of this year, according to Reuters. Two of these incidents resulted in deaths. And as war chokes Europe, a small southern neighbor of Russia is enjoying an unexpected economic boom. Georgia is on course to become one of the world's fastest growing economies this year, following a dramatic influx of more than 100,000 Russians since Moscow's invasion of Ukraine and President Vladimir Putin's mobilization drive to drum up war recruits. As much of the globe teeters towards recession, 
This country of 3.7 million people bordering the Black Sea is expected to record a vigorous 10% growth in economic output for 2022 amidst a consumption-led boom, according to international institutions. That would see the modest $19 billion economy, well known in the region for its mountains, forests and wine valleys, outpace supercharged emerging markets such as Vietnam and oil exporters like Kuwait, buoyed by high crude prices. At least 112,000 Russians have emigrated to Georgia since uh, September this year. On the economy side, Georgia is doing very well. If you are talking about the GDP growth for 20, uh, this year for 2022, the growth will be minimum 10, 10%. And this is driven by the different uh, indicators, such as exports, remittances, tourist inflows, and this is the main drivers for the economic growth. And I think uh, probably this will be continued also in 2023. All the industries are doing quite well, very well. So I mean, beginning from the micro and in the, in the corporate, and I mean just beginning from the retail and the different kind of industries. I could not remember now any industry which this year has a problem. Only challenge for the macro in Georgia for this year is inflation, which has a good trend. I can say that from the beginning of this month, we see that trend is a little bit going down, and our uh, forecast that before the end of this year, inflation will go down to 9.5%. But as it's a high inflation we have in the country, uh, you are right, so it influences the living standards of the population. So these migrants are very helpful because part of them, died, probably the majority of them, very young, technology educated people who have a knowledge and probably the, for us, for the PUC, but also for the other Georgian companies, this is a quite useful opportunity to use that. So even in the midst of war, quite a lot of uh, benefits, uh, depending on where you are. Laddie Williams, good morning. Good morning. Laddie is uh, <laughs> of our business desk. Georgia is booming. Yeah. Um, 10% growth. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not too sure I've heard of any other country in recent times. Each uh, time you sit here, you talk to me about recession. E exactly. Recession, and uh, Interest rate hikes. Some are shrugging it off. And uh, it's interesting because, you know, we've, we've heard talks about, you know, windfall tax for country for companies, yeah. you know, benefiting, you know, from the, the war in Ukraine. Particularly you know, oil companies. With, with oil companies. So maybe we could look at some, you know, windfall tax for countries like, <laughs> like Georgia. Georgia, which are, which are uh, 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 benefiting, you know. Yeah. So about 112,000 Russians, you know, have moved, uh, you know, to Georgia, you know, as uh, Russia actually invaded Ukraine. And when people move, they move with money. So we've seen about over a, hundred, over a billion dollars, you know, actually moved, transferred to Georgia, Georgia. via uh, bank transfer, you know, and uh, other money transfer, you know, avenues by Russians. So they're moving there, they're moving there with money. And, you know, we've seen Georgia, you know, get some of that, Take that one yeah. in. And that has also helped, you know, boost uh, their currency as a Georgian Larry. That's, it's, that's actually, you know, strengthening at this point because of the inflows. And, you know, analysts are expecting more, you know, inflows. Even though the EBRD forecasted that Georgia's economy you know, is going to uh, uh, get into a recession due to the war because they get most of their, you know, uh, from business Russia. from Ukraine and, and Russia. Russia. So it's, it's flipped over now, you know, with this uh, <laughs> new trend, you know, of Russians actually moving there, taking all that funds in, in there. But some are warning that, you know, the, the country is still at risk, that's Georgia, if... Uh, you know, the war ends and Russians and go back. Go back home. Go back home. So They'll be leaving a lot of disgruntled. Exactly. Disgruntled They're going to take a lot of funds with them out too. So Indeed. that's the risk. Now, Russia is seeking sanctions exemptions for its state bank in the Ukraine Grain Initiative. What's that about? Right. So obviously we know uh, Ukraine, they've been making their own demands, you know, to make sure they can actually get their grains, you know, out, you know, into markets that actually need them. So... Russia is also facilitating this, making this happen. So they also, they also have their own demands. And with the sanctions, you know, the U.S. and its allies have, you know, levied on their financial system. They're trying to get some leeway, you know, there. See if they can lift some of these sanctions so that they can also facilitate, you know, exports out of Ukraine. They can actually stick to the deal and also profit. Because at the end of the day, Ukraine is profiting 
from getting all of those exports, those grains out. They're making money. Russia is also going to make money from that because they also account for uh, the, 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 the world's uh, uh, grain exports too. So I don't know that they're asking for some sanctions, you know, removed from their, from their financial system. And at the end of the day, it remains to be seen if this will actually be, uh, agreed, to. be agreed to. But it could be a deal breaker. It depends on how you know, the U.S. and allies actually respond, respond to this. To and so we'll, we'll be watching how that actually plays out. Because at the end of the day, uh, hunger is a risk. <laughs> how, 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 how are the markets doing at the start of the week? Yeah, so uh, the, the markets are looking, uh, they're looking good. You know, in the U.S., I saw the futures there in the green. But China is the major one, you know, on everyone's mind right now because they, they have their plans to actually... Uh, do away with the COVID uh, zero policy, All right. and we're seeing investors, you know, starting to position themselves for that. Even though China has come out to say we're not, you know, uh, doing we're not that doing yet. that yet. Yeah, right. but uh, just in case, investors are saying, you know what, do as I say, but you know, watch my actions. So they're watching the actions and they're seeing that there is a possibility that China, you know, might uh, do away with the with the, COVID, with the zero COVID policy. And uh, we see uh, analysts already expecting that equities in China are going to jump over 20 percent. So we're seeing investors, you know, starting to take position, you know, they want anticipating. To benefit from that, yeah. yeah, because nobody wants to miss that run that that, that would happen if if the COVID uh, zero COVID policy Does actually move? Yeah. Uh, actually removed. So we're seeing that play into other markets. Market is looking good, but we're seeing the U.S. They're, they're awaiting the CPI report. Uh, so once that comes out, obviously we're going to see some volatility in the market. But analysts are still expecting the bottom is close. There might be some kind of rally, you know, in November and maybe, you know, into December. We get that kind of Santa rally. Who knows? But we're still seeing volatile markets. Headwinds are still there. Inflation is still rising. Uh, so it remains to be seen. But some investors are sticking their head out and taking positions at this time. Indeed, we'll have to wait and see how, how, how they do, because taking positions can go either oh, way. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, 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 Ladi, thanks for that. Uh, Thank Ladi will be, of course, uh, here after this program uh, with Business Morning and later on in the day with Business Incorporated, where the Nigerian uh, stock market yep. uh, is doing the physical first physical day, trading. Physical trading day. That's, yeah. uh, that's a big one. Yeah. Uh, that's talking about since COVID. Yep, since uh, COVID. So, uh, I took a while, uh, but it seems to be back, and uh, we'll see how the market performs. We'll see how they actually that. feel coming out there. <laughs> out there. Thanks, Laddie. Um, let's talk uh, uh, to Professor David Awurao, head of Department of History and Strategic Studies at the University of Lagos in uh, 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 Akoka. Uh, good morning to you, Prof. Prof joins us uh, uh, virtually. Uh, let me start from... Um, where I stopped with my uh, last guest. Uh, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm made to understand that uh, we seem to have lost Prof for a moment there. We hope we'll be able to get him back. Uh, but in the meantime, let's take a break. And when we return, uh, in Russian hell, Donetsk uh, released prisoners of war return home to tearful uh, reunions. That's the details in a moment. Please stay on with us. Welcome back. Thanks for staying tuned. Many around the world are standing up for Ukraine with anti-war protests against Russia's invasion. Over the weekend, demonstrations broke out in many cities across Europe with people coming together to show their support for Ukraine and condemn Moscow's actions. Over the weekend, protests held in European cities against the war in Ukraine. Several hundred Ukrainians and Iranians in German exile joined forces on Saturday to take part in a freedom march in the city of Klon. Police declined to give a figure for the number of protesters and instead pointed to the protest organizers who were not immediately reachable. In Italy, Thousands took to the streets to say no to the war and to put an end to the war in Ukraine. 
The new Italian government, led by Giorgia Meloni, has repeatedly pledged support for Kyiv, while her coalition allies, Silvio Berlusconi and Matteo Salvini, have been more ambivalent on the issue due to their historic ties with Russian President Vladimir Putin. The protests also come as Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky dismissed talks of limited Iranian supplies to Russia, saying Ukraine had downed 11 drones on Friday alone. He accuses Tehran of lying, saying Kyiv's forces were downing at least 10 of the unmanned aerial vehicles every day. Iran has acknowledged for the first time that it had supplied Moscow with drones, but said they were sent before the war in Ukraine, where Russia has used them to target power stations and civilian infrastructure. All right, I understand we have Professor David Awarao back uh, uh, on uh, with us uh, virtually. Professor Awarao is uh, head of Department of History and Strategic Studies at the University of Lagos. Good morning to you, Prof. Uh, as I was saying, uh, I wanted to start off for, with this uh, uh, grain initiative and what Russia is asking for uh, as part of its continued cooperation. Do you think that um, given the fact that it had suspended its participation and then said it was going to continue, and now it's saying, look, if you want us to continue, you are going to have to consider more seriously our demands about our own agricultural products and fertilizer. Do you think the, the Western nations uh, are going to respond to this, especially positively? Uh, um, thank you very much. Um, I think the West will consider that uh, because uh, the uh, war itself has created this uh, global food crisis, and uh, there is a feeling that uh, the ability to evacuate, to get those grains out to the countries uh, and people that uh, uh, need them um, is, is, is uh, critical to um, reducing the, the, the intensity of uh, the global food crisis. And, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, at times like this, um, concessions would normally be granted. Uh, but, uh, Russia wasn't going to allow the grains to be moved out before. It had the security fears. It had these concerns that uh, it would provide an avenue for weapons to be, you know, smuggled to Ukraine and all that. But, you know, um, Turkey intervened. And, of course, the United Nations also came into the picture and uh, Russia's fears were allayed, and that was how the whole export of grains commenced in the first place. The question to ask to, that people ask is, what concession has the West granted um, to, to be able to get uh, Russia to continue to support the arrangement uh, for the, for the uh, evacuation of the grains? So I would think that uh, uh, Russia's demand would be you know, will be granted. I mean, they may not, they may not grant everything that uh, Russia wants, but to some degree, uh, you know, that if uh, Ukraine's grains can be allowed to be moved to Turkey and then to other parts of the world, uh, why can't Russia benefit from that? So the, the intensity of the global food crisis arising from the invasion itself, I think would, uh, would, would influence the West and the rest of the world to consider Russia's... Uh, uh, demands so that some of his products too can also be exported to you know some other parts of the world. So I think concession will be granted somewhere along the line. There is, uh, Prof, uh, a sense of history about all of this, uh, especially when people mention that conflict uh, is usually uh, ended by diplomacy. Uh, that's what history has taught us. You know, even when there are victors and losers, they still need to sit down and agree to the terms of what will now happen thereafter. Uh, in this case, there are no yet, uh, there, there are, we don't have winners or losers yet. Uh, we just have this slow grinding process where it doesn't seem as if anybody is going to emerge victorious. And you have the West on one hand, you have Russia on the other, 
and you have uh, North Korea, the likes of Iran, to a lesser extent China, are we, without admitting it, uh, returning to a situation where we have uh, a bipolar world led by two different groups of countries uh, with very different ideologies and different uh, views on how uh, countries relate with each other? Well, um, the contemporary global system um, is uh, multipolar. And uh, it doesn't seem that that is going to change anytime soon. Uh, there are many poles. It is true that uh, China supports uh, Russia in the war, and understandably so, because China, um, the West is taking measures to undermine China, and China also sees uh, looks for any opportunity to also try to you know uh, fight back, so to speak. But if you look at China's position, the, the support for Russia is not is not total, is not whole. Uh, you know, China has its own interest. China's interest revolves around the maintenance of global stability to enable it to be able to you know you know. It's uh, uh, not right uh, to think that, uh, oh, all of a sudden, a bipolar system has now emerged. The system that has emerged is not bipolar. We have made a transition from a unipolar world that was established in the immediate aftermath of the Cold War, 1989 to about 1992. And from that time to, to up to this time, things have changed very dramatically, such that we now have a multipolar you know, structure where you have the U.S. on the one hand, the West, the, the rest of the Europe, the West supporting it, and the countries here and there in the middle who are not supporting the West uh, wholeheartedly. And of course, we have China there, not supporting Russia wholeheartedly as well. We have North Korea, and then we also have uh, the BRICS countries, you know, that sometimes they support the West, sometimes they're on their own, and all that. So a, 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 a bipolar world is not about to emerge. Uh, what we have emerging is, a, you know, a, a multipolar world. But whatever you know, uh, uh, categorization, the importance is to have a structure that guarantees global peace and security. And just to take off from where you where you started, uh, the earlier the, the the conflictants realize the need for uh, diplomatic engagement to end this war, the better. I say this because um, the 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 um, you know uh, Ukraine. Is gaining grants, is serving the upper hand right now, just as you said in the introduction when you started. I mean, uh, Ukraine is making a whole lot of uh, inroads and gaining grants. Russia is withdrawing from many towns they had occupied before. But Russia is not going away any, you know, not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, Russia is still able to have the capacity to, you know, destroy many critical infrastructure across Ukraine, including the capital Kiev. So that means that we have got to the point of stalemate. And when a, a, a war becomes stalemated, you know, what should come very quickly is diplomacy to resolve it, because a victor will not likely emerge from this war in the next 10 years. So the earlier both sides realize the futility of victory for either side and come for genuine and constructive diplomatic engagement, the better for them and the better for the rest of the global community. Very grim there, uh, Prof, uh, when, you when you talk that about 10 years, but I I'm sure that there, there are a lot of people who agree with you because it doesn't look like any victor is going to emerge very soon, but uh, a lot to chew. Professor Awarawa, thank you so much uh, for your time and for your perspective this morning. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks so very much, Daddy. Uh, let's take a look at uh, some of the sports out of this conflict. Ukrainian heavyweight champion Alexander Yusik has set Tyson Fury a deadline of March the 4th, 2023 for their proposed undisputed world heavyweight title showdown to take place. Uh, Yusik is eager to put his IBF, WB and WBO belts on the line. The 35-year-old has revealed that his team is seeking conversation with the Gypsy King, but admits that the Briton is a very unpredictable person. If Fury agrees to that date, he would be left with just 13 weeks between facing a Dennis Chisora and participating in the most historic fight of his career.
And pressure is mounting on the International Fencing Federation to maintain its exclusion of athletes from Russia and Belarus from FIE competitions as the clock ticks down towards the FIE Congress in Luzon later on this month. In a later address to the FIE interim president, Emmanuel Katsiadakis, and delegates to the approaching Congress, Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleva sought to highlight the presence of Russian Armed Forces members in the country's team at the Beijing 2022 Winter Games. According to Mr. Kuleva, every sixth of Russia's 214 athletes competing at the Winter Olympics 2022 in Beijing was a member of the Russian Armed Forces. Currently, athletes from Russia and Belarus are excluded from FRA competitions because of the war in Ukraine in accordance with an International Olympic Committee recommendation. And finally, fighters affiliated with the Russian-installed administration of Ukraine's eastern Donetsk region have arrived in the town of Amvariska after being freed in a prisoner swap with the Ukrainian military. The fighters were freed during a prisoner exchange with the two sides in the eight-month-old conflict, releasing 107 captives each. Prisoner exchanges have been a regular occurrence during the conflict, with both military personnel and hand-ranking politicians released in swaps. In Amvariska, a town of 18,000 people, close to the internationally recognized border with Russia, Denis Pushling, head of the region's Russian-installed administration, greeted the returning fighters. Some of the men wept as they were reunited with their family members. <laughs> Tough. Uh, that's where we end the program of this morning. Thanks for being with us. My name is Ladi Akkari Dolwale. There's an update at 5 o'clock within the world today. And indeed, there are other updates of all the other stories throughout the day. But for now, to go out there and have a great week ahead. Good morning.